the river Jordan, and I will then say to thee, you are my friend, carry me like you were my brother, love me like a mother, will you be there? High notes. That's, uh, I don't know how you do that. It's incredible. Have you guys enjoyed the songs we've been able to have the last couple, couple of weeks? Every single one of them has just been such a blessing. Today, we're going to talk about love busters and being in community. And before we do, let me pray with you. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your guidance. Lord, we thank you for the Psalms. Today, we ask that you'll just open our hearts to something new. How wonderful it is, how pleasant, when brothers and sisters live in harmony. For harmony is a pre- as precious as a fragrant anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head and ran down onto his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew on Mount Hermon. On the mountains of Israel, and God has pronounced this eternal blessing on Jerusalem, even life forever. Amen? One of the shortest psalms today. One of my longest sermons. You're welcome. What does it mean to be in community? What does it mean to learn to get along and work together and argue and fight and love one another and forgive one another? What does it mean to be in community? I can tell you over and over again, I've had people walk in this room, and the first thing they'll notice is, oh, that's weird, it's a pyramid. 
But then they'll get past that, and then they'll begin to notice some things about our church. And I find it really interesting because some of the words people often say to me is, it felt like home. It felt relaxed. I'll get words like authentic. And I think when I hear that, as a leadership team especially, that's one of the highest compliments I've ever received. This place feels like home. How do we continue stumbling and fumbling, though, toward a better and better sense of community? How many of you have ever been to a church or a community and you thought, that was scary? Raise your hand. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Other times you walk away and you're like, oh, so good. So beautiful. I love this place. I remember when I was younger, my parents, we, uh, we did a lot of church hopping. We were shopping. We wanted to find the right church. And so you guys know how it is. You walk in, your parents are like, good carpet, not a fan of the pews, a little bit tough on the, the backside. The pastor, he lands the plane, then he picks it up again, lands it. I wish he'd just land the sermon. You get all these, you're looking for the right church. And so I remember we went to this church in Lansing, Michigan for almost like, I want to say eight years. And I remember one day as we were driving to church, and anyone with a family knows this, everything's going haywire, no one's wearing the right clothing, Tony's clip-on tie is not quite functioning correctly, we have a wardrobe malfunction later. And so we have all these issues going on, we're all fighting, no one's really had breakfast. And I hear my parents, they start talking, and they're talking in a a very, very hushed tone. So as a kid, you kind of lean in. What's going on? What are mom and dad talking about? And when you get a little bit older, you get really good at pretending like you're listening to music, but you're totally into their conversation. And I remember my my dad saying, you know, it's such a shame, such a shame. We're going to have to say bye to him. He's going to have to leave our congregation. I think they're going to ask him to leave next week. And I'm like, who are they talking about? And then my mom says this. And again, I was very young. I didn't know. My mom said, yeah, he he, he finally came out of the closet. And I thought, what closet? <laughs> so I'm beginning to wonder, where did, my, where did this guy go and what closet is he going to? And so I'm listening, finally, I'm like, Mom, Dad, what closet? Is there a special closet in the church somewhere? I got to know about this closet. My parents immediately, oh, no, he's asking another one of those questions. I, we don't have graphs or anything this time in the car to prepare for this. And so... My parents are, you know, they're fumbling, they're stumbling, trying to work through uh, what's going on with this individual. And, and, and I'm like, well, can I go into the closet? No, mate, I don't know. It's your choice. We'll love you either way. Ah! My parents don't know what they're, ah. And years later, I actually, I cringe when I think about this story. I didn't know what was going on. But what happened is this individual felt so connected to the community, he felt he could finally be honest. And when that happened, they pushed him out. And today I get this just very painful feeling when I think about that experience. I remember that we moved from Lansing to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and again, church hopping. And I remember my parents saying, we're going to go check out Sparta. Sparta was a very tiny little church. It kind of looked like that one. And I remember walking into Sparta's church and sitting down, nothing but old people. And then I hear all the hymns sung at least two times slower than they should. And I'm just sitting there cringing. And then I begin to notice there's a little bit of drama up front because someone up there, they they seem like something's rattled someone. And I'm watching and they seem a little rattled. And so I'm watching. And then finally, after we've sung one song, I feel like we sang that one song slow time, like five or six times too many times. I'm sitting there, and finally the head elder gets up and says, <sighs> the, uh, our pastor, he's running late. Should be here any time. We're going to do it one more time. No! <laughs> Not one more time. <laughs> so we do it one more time. And then I see this man cross the, the stage. He sits down on the, you know, the older churches, they have the, the holiest of holy seat, which has like more of a pinnacle, and then you have the smaller ones. He sat on that one. I assumed he was the pastor. He didn't have a bishop hat or anything, but he was still in the middle seat. And so he sat there, and I'm watching, and after the song, the eternal song that goes on and on, finished, 
he got up and he was really excited. And he said, this morning I had a miracle. And I thought, I didn't. You've missed the sweet praise set. But he got up and he said, this morning on my drive in, there was a car on the side of the road. The hood was up. There was a woman standing next to it. There was a child in the back. And I felt impressed to stop and see if they were okay. When I stopped, the woman said she'd been driving all night long. And again, as a kid listening to this, you're like, tell me more. He hasn't quoted the Bible. He hasn't, he hasn't sang another hymn. I like this guy. Tell me more, pastor. He starts telling the story and everyone's fully into it. So he says, the woman's been driving all night. And so I asked, what do you need? She said, I'm out of gas. He said, let me drive you and your daughter to get some gas. Okay. So I drive them to get gas. And on the way, she tells me her story. She said, her husband has been abusive for many, many years. And last night, he finally turned on her daughter. And when he passed out on the floor, she took everything she could, packed it into a car, and has been driving all night long. So I gave her gas. And she's in our mother's room right now. I remember thinking, whoa. She's in the mother's room. She's in the mother's room. This is an interesting story. And then he said, he said, is there anyone in this room that would be willing to take her and her daughter home today and let her have a hot shower and just relax? Hand after hand after hand went up. And I'm just looking around the room. Like, what? And then he says this, I think we need to have a potluck after church. Can you all come back in an hour and bring some food and celebrate with this mother and daughter? Hand after hand after hand went up. And then, then he says, let's take an offering now. And I watched immediately. There was no questions. Well, what about church? What about offering? Is, is, this, is this biblically correct? None of that. Immediately, offering comes down. People are giving money. And then he ends by reading some scripture. I couldn't even tell you what it was about learning to give and love. And then he prayed. And then he said this. She's in the mother's room. Please show her love and kindness. And that was the end of the sermon. Shortest sermon I've ever experienced. Most powerful one I've ever experienced. And then the sermon continued because I walked with my parents out into the small little corridor and I watched as people lined up and went inside and hugged this weeping woman. And then we stayed and had potluck and I watched as people just lavished her and her daughter with love. People went out and bought a bunch of gifts for her daughter because they knew she probably didn't have any toys. That morning, my parents and I experienced community. And it was so tangible, so powerful. It was a group of people who said, we want to let love unite us. And the psalmist in chapter 133, the psalmist understood what it looked like to be united as a community. How wonderful it is, how pleasant when brothers and sisters live in unity. And the word unity here, it means closeness. It actually means to give someone that holy kiss of closeness, togetherness. Now, here's the thing about community. When we get in conflict, sometimes we tend to do two things. We will completely avoid the situation, won't we? Ever been in a relationship with someone? No. <laughs> Not anymore. It ended because we kept avoiding each other. Yeah, sometimes we tend to get into these frustrating arguments or conflicts, and what we'll sometimes do is we'll just avoid each other altogether, because that seems easier, right? But what oftentimes happens, especially in a relationship, when there are key issues and things going on, and we choose not to talk about them, there begins to be a space between the two people, and it grows and grows and grows. And, because, and essentially what you do is you become your own people apart from the other, and the relationship starts to die. 
And in a church community, when we begin to avoid the deeper issues, avoid the deeper discussions, church community begins to fall apart. There are certain topics that we as a tribe have avoided for a long time. I have to be honest with you. I wish that we were the church at the very forefront of equality discussion. We should have been the first church to ordain a woman. We should have been the very first. We have, we have, we have a prophet, <laughs> and yet we're not ordaining women. It blows my mind. We should have been at the very front of this. And yet, it was a difficult conversation, and so we avoided it. And we do this often, and because we do this, we lose key leaders Great speakers, great, great people out the back door. We should not be avoiding things. We should be coming together in closeness and unity and having the conversations. The other thing is sometimes we get a little too close, don't we? I don't like what you did. I don't like what you said. That didn't land well for me. And now I'm going to get you. And we'll almost come to just, we'll fight and it'll get ugly because the thing is taken on. It's become part of my identity. And I think sometimes for a unified group of people, we have to be careful of that too. The psalmist understood there has to be a balance in order to find unity. Another thing I'm learning through the psalmist, for unity is as precious as the fragrant anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head, ran down onto his beard and onto the border of his robe. For a Hebrew reading this, they would have picked up on some things you and I probably wouldn't. First off, anointing oil. When someone is anointed, it's saying this, Everywhere you go, you will bring life. Everywhere you go, you bring life. You're anointed. And it starts here as the individual. And it goes down until it hits the border of the robe. The border of the robe is where on a prayer shawl you have these things called zitzi. These little hangy bally things. And what those were, were, those were a symbolic representation of Israel. So watch me now. Everywhere you go in relationship with your partner, your family, you are called to bring life to conversation, life to the table. And everywhere you go in community, you're called to do the same and to the world. But here's the question I have for you. What if I'm not bringing life to my own relationship with my partner? Is it easy to bring life to community when that is struggling there? Do I have any business if I'm not helping in my own community here in Orange County taking a message to the world? I think, I think there's a progression here that needs to be understood. Healing, repair takes place here and it goes outward. And before a community can really be fully present in life giving, it must first experience life itself. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew on Mount Hermon. I don't even know if I'm saying that. I feel like Hermon. <laughs> on the mountains of Israel. <laughs> Tiber, you wouldn't understand Hermon. And God has pronounced this eternal blessing on Jerusalem, even life forever. This place is a holy consecrated place. That's what the word means here, this mountain. So watch me now. We like to call certain places holy, don't we? The holy sanctuary, where we've got the good carpet. The children's wing, where diapers abound. We've got this place and this place and this place. But here's the thing. None of those places are holy if they are empty. The only time a place is holy is when there is community that is united. So you can have holiness experienced right here in this room at 11 C's, wherever you go, that's where holiness happens because community comes together and they are one. Holiness, that's when you experience holiness. Not because you blessed it and threw some water on it, I didn't make it holy. You said a special prayer. I didn't make it holy. What made the thing holy was when all of you came together and you brought goodwill and love and compassion and mercy and direction and vision to the thing that you're all present for. That's when the thing becomes holy because you brought that. 
This guy's name, Willard Harvey, Harley, Harley. I can't read it from here. Harley, good, I got it right, beautiful. Obviously, I've read his books a billion times. I've read his books a couple times. And uh, he, uh, yeah, he looks old. And his books, they, uh, they've been around for a while. But he has such profound, beautiful information there. And here's the cool thing about some of the things he says. What I'm finding is, as I'm learning not to be a, a terrible husband, <laughs> as I'm learning to be a better husband and a better partner and a better person in general, I'm learning that that actually carries over into community. The same principles you learn about learning to be a better partner, a better human, it crosses over into how to be in community better together. So he shares a couple things. One of them is this, which I think is kind of fun. Love banks. Love banks. Let me share this with you. All of you, if you've ever been in a relationship, what would happen if, let's say, let's say Luke and I were just, we're good friends. We're in a relationship. And... Man, this has got fun real quick. And so in this relationship, I am always giving, giving, giving. That's what I do. Ask Danielle. I'm a giver. Give, give, give. Luke takes, takes, takes. I take the trash out. I do the dishes. I make the bets. Luke just takes, takes, takes. You would say that relationship is not healthy, wouldn't you? You say, that's not a healthy relationship at all. He just takes, you give. When is your cup full? It's never full. The kitchen sink is full. Oh, my heart. You say, that's unhealthy. But watch this now. When we step into church and community, oftentimes we love the music. Edson will nail the song. Should have had a white glove, but you nailed the song. And the sermon wasn't terrible, and, and things and the good food was delicious. And we take, 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 we consume, we consume, we consume. But let me ask you, when's the last time you gave the gift that you have? When's the last time you participated in the discussions? When's the last time you were part of the thing rather than simply taking, taking, taking? What if community what if, what if our community knew us as participants in this community in which we gave, gave, gave? What I see a lot of times, churches are really good at taking and asking for things. But what if the, what if the community was like, hey, you guys are always giving. What can we do for you? That seems weird to say out loud, doesn't it? Because it typically doesn't happen. But that's where we constantly should be giving Taking, giving, taking. We should be always filling up, taking out. We are constantly, we should be in this cycle of always thinking of the other first, knowing that when we need it, we come here, we get filled. That's the kind of community that brings unity and love. Another thing he says that I find really fascinating is honesty. After the sermon, I will walk up and I will shake your hand. And you and I play a game every Sabbath. And it's a really fun one. For many of us, what we'll do is this. I haven't seen you all week. I barely know you, if we're going to be honest. But we'll shake hands. And you'll say this to me. Wonderful sermon, Pastor. And I'll say, Lord blessed. Lord blessed. Happy Sabbath, brother. And you'll walk out. And that's where we are. And, and I'll assume that your week must have been fantastic. We had a great conversation for two seconds. I felt connected. If we're going to be honest, that's not really authentic, is it? That's the only time I see you during the week. It, look, it reminds me more of like Facebook. And let me, let me share with you what I mean by that. On Facebook, we're this generation that we're really good at this. That's a good one. Got it. Just the right. Good. Because what we're good at on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat is we're really good at taking the picture that we think best. Well, it gives the very best of who we think we are. Ever been in a, in a group of people and there's always that one person that has a selfie stick and they always want to take group pictures? 
And you're like, for the love, please, I just don't want to take another picture. Everybody! And then you're like... <laughs> and then afterwards, the honest moment comes when you do this. <sighs> and then you get back to being normal. Because your butt doesn't look that good. You just got the right perspective. Because that's not honest. That's not real. I stalked some of you on Facebook, and I didn't ask permission today. My friend Nick, I'll start with this one because it's nice. My friend Nick, he's a great dad. Posts all these pictures about he and his sons going out, having fun, camping. And I'll look at that and I'll feel immediately shamed. From my perspective, while I'm sitting on the toilet, no, legs numb, because I've been there for an hour, looking at your photos, not weird at all. I'll go through and I'll see these and I'll think, what a miserable dad I am. I don't do half of this stuff. He's always posting this. Right? My friend Holly, she's got these great pictures of working out. And I'm thinking, man, if I could look like, I don't look like that when I'm lifting. I'm pretty sure I don't look like that. But she takes these pictures every day and I'm thinking, well, how does she get there? She must just live there. She must have all the time in the world, Holly. And there's the Cabreras. These people are beautiful, if you, if you know them. And they're always taking these romantic pictures of getaways. And I tease you guys every, every single week I see you. Because I live vicariously through them. I'm like, where'd you guys go last week? You did what? I picture the two of you just waking up in the morning. You're like, I love you, baby. I love you too. We live in paradise. And that's what I picture. I assume that must be the reality, right? Yeah, it must be because that's what your Facebook pictures show. I see my friends who get to go out and have fun all the time. And they're always smiling and having fun. And I feel like they do this all the time without me. They must not have jobs. That's the reality. But if I were to talk to my friend Nick, he would say parenting is hard. And these are only like, 1% of my day or my week. And I'm so thankful I just post them. No, the reality is after that picture was taken, my son almost fell in the fire. My, uh, this happened, this happened. Everyone lost it. I didn't even get to eat s'mores. I was sitting alone by myself. <laughs> Perrier and a s'more. Sad day. You'd, you'd hear from Holly saying, it was, it's tough getting to this place. I have to wake up at 3.30 in the morning just to get a workout. That's what she'd tell you. Our friends would tell us, they would tell you, it's not actually that easy, is it? Can you just tell everyone it's not easy? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> Learning to be a couple for the first couple of years, that's difficult sometimes and frustrating. You have fights and you have arguments. They would tell you the truth. And it probably took a very long time to get your dog to pose just like that. <laughs> Am I right? Tell me it took a long time. Thank you. Because that never happens with my dog. Thank you. My friends would tell me, yeah, we were there, but afterwards we had these deep discussions and this and that, and we only get to go out maybe once or twice a week. And when we do, it's nice. The reality is... That if we don't get to know each other, if we don't spend time outside of just the one hour, then community, unity, we don't really experience that. It becomes a very surface thing. And I think for us to become unified, one, we have to start spending time together. We have to spend time having conversations, talking to one another, delving into some of the deep issues. And here's another reality to this. When you get to know that person after the honeymoon's over, you're arguing, aren't you? over ridiculous stuff. You didn't make the bed. I didn't think about it. We have a billion pillows to put on the bed. Is that not making a bed when I don't put all the pillows on the bed? <laughs> well, no. Oh, geez, really? But as you move into a community, you begin to have some definite conflicts. And here's the reality to that is this. Conflict means that you've moved beyond the surface. What if we looked at conflict as a community as a blessing? We're not just a surface community where we're just kind of like, eh, hey, no problem, see you next week. And we're a community where we're like, I don't agree with you and that shirt. And I'm going to talk to you about it. We have discussions. We have arguments. And I think that's good. 
discussions, arguments, those things are really life bringing if we do them well. And so we can do them well, can't we? Here are a couple ideas I want to share with you before we close is this. When you, before you get into an argument, wouldn't it be beautiful? Whether it's between your spouse or your friend or your father-in-law or a church member. Wouldn't it be fantastic if you said this? Let's set some ground rules. First off, I need you to know that I love you. I care about you. And we're going to get through this thing. We are going to dedicate, commit ourselves to getting through this thing. We're going to speak to each other respectfully, openly, honestly, and we're not going to use words that are, that are pointing fingers at one another. Can you imagine if that's how board meeting went, David? Right? Yeah, I would never talk again. <laughs> Identify the problem and the perspectives. Understand where people are coming from. Oh, you come from this perspective. I see why you understand it that way. Okay, got it. Good, let's move on. We seek solutions. We seek solutions. Again, we commit to having a solution. We commit to not just walking away from it, avoiding it. Maybe, maybe we sleep on it. Maybe we come back next Tuesday, whatever it is, but we're not going to give up on this thing. We're going to be committed to it. My last favorite one is Emma. And when my friend Bob shared this with me, I was laughing because I thought, how corny is that? It's really funny, but it's actually really beautiful. Emma. Emma means, Bob, just say it out loud. I feel like this is your moment. Enthusiastic Isn't that good? Enthusiastic mutual agreement. And here's what I'm learning about being in a relationship with people. Sometimes you agree, but you didn't really agree, did you? Yes, I'll take the trash out. You're not going to take the trash out. Okay, fine. I'm okay with the pillows. You're not okay with the pillows. If you can say to yourselves, I want to get to the place where when we finally come to a conclusion, we are actually enthusiastically, mutually agreeing on this thing. What if in community we learn to do this? What if at a board meeting we said, is everyone... I mean, are there still some people who are not really enthusiastic about this? Any, any head of a board would be like, that's suicide, Tony. <laughs> You're asking for like another eight hours. And all we're talking about this week is like the carpet, yeah. right? But what if we started asking and seeking to find Emma in our issues and our conflicts? I think we'd begin to move toward what the psalmist says is unity. Let me end with a story. A friend of mine, he, uh, he grew up as a latchkey kid. And so from six years old until all the way through high school, he would show up at home. And usually mom and dad were gone. They were both working long hours every day. And he would have to make himself breakfast, have to pack himself a lunch. He'd get home. Sometimes there'd be food or he'd just have cereal again. And he kind of got used to that. But at one point in time, my friend said, Travis said that uh, new neighbors moved in. And these new neighbors were kind of odd, he said, because they were always smiling. And so he was suspicious. And the other weird thing is, again, they went to a funeral every single Saturday. So he would see them leave their houses and suits and ties, and he thought, these people are weird. But then the, the kids started to invite him over their house, and he started to get to know his family. And they started to invite him for dinner. And he said he'd never felt that kind of love before. And before you know it, he said, can I go to whatever you guys are going to? <laughs> sure. So they brought him to church. And he said, they're at church. And we take this for granted, by the way. He said, they're at church, 12 years old. Grown-ups are coming and shaking his hand, asking him about his week. People are affirming this kid who is rarely talked to throughout the week to anyone. People are hugging him, asking where he lives. He's getting this attention he's never had before. So Travis... 
He said he just loved us. Every single chance he could, he went to church with them. And he said one day, before the sermon, the choir director got up. And he said, I'm looking for more musicians. I'm looking for some young ones. And again, this was a very small, conservative church. And Travis, he was so excited. So afterwards, he ran to the choir director and said, I'm really good. I would love to play with you guys. Music? Choir director said, yes, son. He said, I can keep a rhythm. Well, that's good, son. Can I show up early and practice a little bit before everybody arrives? Absolutely. We do Wednesday practices. We'd love to have you. I'll give you the music beforehand. What a sweet boy, the choir director thought. And so the boy showed up an hour and a half beforehand with his drum set. And he got in. And he set up his drum set right there on the stage. And all the choir seats were there. And he started practicing. And Travis said, he started playing. And as people started to come in, he kind of stopped because he started to notice people were surprised to see him. He said they wore big smiles. And he said, people started sitting in their seats looking at their music. And he said the choir director got up and he kind of looked at Travis. And then he turned to his choir and he said, I'm so thankful that Travis is here today. And he's come to share his gift. I'm so thankful for our young people. And what he did with Travis, Travis didn't play the full drum set, but he taught Travis how to play the snare at the right points in time for the choir. And my friend's church, what happened is they probably were one of the only Seventh-day Adventist conservative churches there in the Midwest with a drum set and a choir at the same time. But here's the beauty of it. That church and that community, they understood the importance of love guiding every decision they made. They under the, understood the importance of what it means to be united and growing together. They understood that community doesn't just happen in a service. It happens all throughout the week when we show each other grace and love and we accept the little boy who's been broken and hurting and what he has to offer may not be acceptable to some, but we learn to accept him because we love him. And we are community. And we're learning to be one. And that's my prayer for us as well. As, as we struggle and fumble together, we continue to learn how to let love navigate us, navigate the path we're all on. We begin to be that kind of community that shows love, repair, forgiveness, redemption, restoration. We become that kind of community here, outside of our church, and to the world. May God bless you today. Thank you.